so uh, the evolutionary worldview that that is sort of animating some of the perspectives that are that are talked about in our books uh, doesn't hold itself out as a panacea at every problem, right? But but it it does. Uh, uh, try to go, it, it's especially effective at recognizing and, and hopefully bringing um, some, some progress around the issues, the social issues where uh, cultural evolution is stuck. And, and the, the main sort of cultural issue, which we talked about and which we have this uh, climate change action plan that we've developed, is around uh, climate change. And, and there we have the dynamics, we haven't talked about them too much tonight, but, but by talking about these worldview structures. Culture evolves, and it evolves in many ways. In some ways, it's a sprawling bush, but in other ways, the evolution has a structure, and part of the structure is because there is this this uh, gravity of values, which which humans I mentioned earlier that it is, as soon as one set of needs are satisfied, uh, uh, a whole new level awakens. This is one of the major insights of Emil Durkheim. Uh, the pioneering sociologist of the 19th century. He sort of understood that, that human needs can never be satisfied. And it's not just because we're greedy. It's just because we can, we have the freedom to always see new ways to improve. And, and some of the most profound ways that humans have improved their conditions is by improving their definition of what counts as improvement. So uh, that's how new worldviews emerge. In other words, within the traditional mythic worldview, uh, there's one criteria for what it means to live a good life, to be pious, to, to, to fulfill your duty within your station, within the feudal hierarchy, etc. cetera. Uh, but with modernism, the individual breaks free, and, and there's careers open to talent, there's meritocracy, there's a value of achievement, uh, and the accumulation of, of wealth and, and status. And although that has its own pathologies, that leads to a new kind of progress. So... I mean, we, again, we could spend a lot of time talking and justifying our concept of these worldviews, but to paraphrase Jean Piaget, there is no development that lacks a structure. And the development of human consciousness has a structure. That structure exhibits uh, stages. You know, although there are some things that don't fit into stages, although a stage conception, uh, there's many ways to divide up the course of history. But what is, is I think, uh, uh, arguably evident within the course of the development of human history is this dialectical progression whereby you have a worldview that it's stable and that as, as it matures uh, it becomes, it, its pathologies are magnified and, and the way forward becomes defined by going beyond the limitations of that worldview into a new worldview and a new frame of reality with a new creation story. That's why evolution is so important because it's it's a creation story not only for the modernist worldview but it can, it'll be, you know, the, our deepening understanding of evolution will continue to provide the, the creation story for all kinds of worldviews into the future. So if you're willing to allow, just for the sake of argument, that there are these worldview structures, and when we begin to understand cultural evolution from that viewpoint, without oversimplifying or you know making it too rigid, or looking at it like architecture, it's more like an ocean current, these value relationships help explain, for example, why uh, the political will to combat climate change is so uh, uh, so lacking at the moment, despite all the many good reasons beyond any climate change science, just the political and economic reasons to move beyond fossil fuels uh, are abundant. Even if we disagree that fossil fuels are warming the planet, evolving our economy into renewable energy is a good idea regardless. But uh, the poll numbers, as we talked about this afternoon, um, have been diminishing precipitously for a lot of reasons, you know, there's there's a lot of uh, corporate lobbying. There are now uh, uh, conservative think tanks that seek to debunk climate change science. There is, uh, uh, you know, all kinds of external reasons. But one reason that's not being examined, which this evolutionary perspective helps illuminate, is this dialectical tension between the, the modernist worldview and this emergent postmodern worldview. This the, the worldview that that although it has many currents and it doesn't, it's not as identifiable as modernism or traditionalism, the worldview, the countercultural worldview that emerges beyond modernism, which is characterized by a deep concern for the environment, by multicultural sensibilities, by uh, concern for those who have been previously marginalized and exploited. Um, this worldview, one of the things that it coheres with is, is, is what all postmodernists in a sense have in common, 
is that they reject modernism in its various forms. You know, anti-modernism is the hallmark of postmodernism. And because these value worldviews are, 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 are dynamic systems, the, the, the values cohere as sets. So the, the value of, of caring for the environment emerges with postmodernism. In other words, but people didn't care about the environment before the, the counter. I mean, they did a little bit, but you could even you could attribute to John Muir, Henry David Thoreau, early forms of postmodern consciousness. So because concern for the environment is a value that is part of a whole set, a dynamic system of values, and what goes with that concern for the environment is pushing off against modernism, there becomes resistance in the mainstream to environmentalism, not for environmentalism itself, but because environmentalism is, is, uh, has a postmodern flavor, a postmodern characteristic that's hard to eradicate. Although Thomas Friedman has been arguing for years that, that green should be the new red, white, and blue, and although there's all kinds of good reasons for, that, for the mainstream, for modernism to embrace concern for the environment, they still resist it. And especially liberal modernists, we can't really attribute to them, you know, it's not, they're not libertarians, right? It's not like they won't, they won't take on bigger than self problems through collective action. You know, it's, 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 not, uh, uh, it's not that they don't believe in science. Part of what's holding them back in their consensus to generate the political will that can take on, you know, the solutions that are going to have to be taken on, whatever solutions you believe we should take, they all begin with some kind of political will which doesn't exist right now. So one of the things we're trying to do is work on the cultural pressure points to try to move both modernism and postmodernism forward in history so that mo the, the postmodern worldview and its environmental agenda can become less in antithesis to the mainstream and more of a synthetic position that can appreciate that modernism isn't going to be vanquished. We're not going to go back to some you know, local pre-modern economy that's the way, the way forward is to embrace this whole system and to make modernism a little bit, a little bit more green without necessarily uh, uh, vanquishing the key values of, of striving to achieve you know, and, and accumulating status and, and, and consumerism. While certainly some forms of modernism are destructive to the environment and are not sustainable, modernist culture and its economy as itself I don't think has to be completely eliminated in order to save the planet. So trying to reduce the tension in the culture war to achieve the laudable goals of combating climate change in an effective way is one of the ways that this evolutionary worldview can help deal with some of the social problems you mentioned.